Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sleep Matters podcast from Dreams. Everything you need to know about how to get a great night's sleep and why it matters so much. I'm Dr. Pixie McKenna, and in this episode, we're chatting about how important what we eat is in terms of getting some good sleep, and also we're dispelling some myths with food and bedtime. So I'm really pleased to say today I'm joined by Christine Bailey, and Christine is an award-winning nutritional therapist with over 18 years of experience. She's also written a number of cookbooks. So welcome, Christine. Thank you. And we also have Alan Flanagan, and Alan specializes in communicating nutritional science, and he's also an expert in nutritional medicine. So hopefully, between the two of them, we can dispel some myths and we can get some tips surrounding food and sleep. Before we get started, Mm. how did you sleep last night? Actually, I sleep pretty well. Um, I have to say, I've got three children. Um, They are all teenagers now, so it's a lot, lot easier. Um, but my sleep is pretty good. I, I'm a very early riser just because I do a lot of gym workouts. So I've now adjusted my sleep patterns so that I go to bed earlier and get up quite early. What time is bed earlier? For me, around about half nine, ten. Okay. But then I'm getting up five, half five. Okay, that's all right. I thought you were going to say like <laughs> eight Not too early. Yeah. And Alan, how did you sleep last night? Um, I slept well, yeah. Um, I... I think I originally started to become interested in sleep um, and nutrition for sleep because historically I've not been a great sleeper. Um, So I was one of those people who tried to troubleshoot as many variables as I could. Um, So I sleep well now, but I, I do a lot of things to get a good night's sleep. Okay, so it's not by accident then. No. So for you, I mean, how has nutrition impacted your sleep or changing your nutrition impacted your sleep? I think it's more a question of how we look at sleep in the overall picture of a 24-hour cycle of our day. So we have internal rhythms known as circadian rhythms, which govern a lot of our processes. They govern the fact that you would naturally wake up in the morning time, perhaps naturally get sleepy in the early evening. Uh, And they govern a whole host of other processes in the body that very much have to do with how we digest, process and use the, the nutrients in the food we eat. And a big shift that's occurred in our environment over the last 40 years has been things like artificial light exposure at night, extended evening illumination, people are simply up later, there's an increased propensity to eat later. Uh, And we have a lot of interesting observations and and some controlled research supporting the idea that later timing of food intake is not ideal for for long-term health. And so I think when we're talking about nutrition strategies to enhance sleep, probably the first point of consideration is the timing of our food intake during the day and not just immediately before bed but actually over the course of the whole day and how that influences our rhythms in a 24-hour sense. Would you agree with that? Oh absolutely I mean one interesting thing because I still see a lot of clients in clinic one of the first things we will look at is when they eat how regularly they eat do they erratically eat do they skip meals Um, and particularly the late night eating. I mean, that's a really tricky one for a lot of people. I've got quite a few people that have a lot of digestive issues. The last thing you want to be doing is eating a heavy meal late at night, Uh, particularly if you suffer with heartburn, you're having any soreness of esophagus or bloating, and then you're eating a meal at nine o'clock at night. It's really gonna keep you up, particularly if you have something that's quite high fat, what fat does is it's a lot harder for the body to digest. It takes a lot longer and it can also increase stomach acid. So if you're one of those people that already has esophagus soreness or heartburn, if you then have quite a heavy fatty meal, that is likely to keep you off. So that absolutely timing is very mm. important. So what time, what's the, the time period in terms of having your supper, your dinner, and then going to bed, how long should you leave it? So for a lot of my clients, I encourage them to do what's called time-restricted eating. So let's try and get them to eat as, uh, well, not as early as possible, but say by about seven. So then mm. you're allowing at least, probably for a lot of clients, three to four hours without having lots of food sitting in your stomach. 
Um, some of my clients find that if they eat too early, then they might have a snack, which will not only be a handful of nuts, it's not a big snack, about an hour, two hours before they go to bed just to stabilize their blood sugar. But that seems to be a really good opportunity for people to get a good meal, but allow time for the digestive system to work before they go to bed. Mm. Okay, and as a previously poor sleeper you mentioned, was that something for you that you used I, to ease in there? I found that, yes, the, the, I used to habitually eat quite late, um, and I did find that I would be quite, um, I would have difficulty falling asleep um, and so the period between going to bed and you actually falling asleep is known as your sleep onset latency. And actually, when you look at the research, it was pretty obvious why I was having that issue mm -hmm. in that meal composition and certainly the timing of a meal in close proximity to bedtime can often increase the time it takes people to get to sleep. And then potentially the composition of the meal, and, and you touched on it there, Christine, mm. but there's some interesting research that suggests if you have quite a high fat meal before you go to bed, it will prevent you having the same amount of time in deep REM sleep mm. that we would want to get, that very restful, restorative sleep phase. So even though people might have the same sleep duration, their sleep quality may be somewhat impaired and they don't necessarily mm. get that quality time spent in, in REM sleep. Mm. So I have found that bringing forward the timing of dinner has helped. The other thing that I think is, is worth noting is that it's not necessarily just the, the, the timing of dinner, but it's also the main meal of the day in a kind of energy sense. So I think it is important to, to qualify that you can still have dinner. I mean, it's not always feasible for people to eat by seven. So if people start making hard and fast rules, so sometimes I'll say, look, it's, it's fine if you're home later than that and you, you have to maybe eat at, at eight. But what I'd say to someone in that circumstance is have more of your daily energy earlier in the day and then just have a lighter dinner if you are mm. with your schedule and whatever, finding yourself home a, a bit later than that. Okay. And um, what about sugar? The big <laughs> bad thing, sugar. It well, again, this is all to do with the timing. So if you're someone who is literally going from one meal to another, craving lots of sugary foods as a pick-me-up and energy source or whatever, then you know we know that not only does sleep affect blood sugar levels, but blood sugar levels can then affect sleep. And if you're someone where <clears throat> your energy is going up and down, your blood sugar is going up and down, then you can potentially then affect other hormones that, such as cortisol and so on, that can then also interfere with the production of melatonin. So um, you know you can have people that will eat a lot of sugary, refined foods during the day and then find that actually they're waking up a lot in the night and their blood sugar's all over the place. Right. Um, so there's nothing wrong with carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between sugar and carbohydrates. Um, and actually, I encourage my clients in the evening to have a little bit more carbohydrate. Um, we know that that can help with tryptophan across the brain, which can then help with serotonin and melatonin. So I don't want people to necessarily go completely low carb, particularly not in the evening, but the refined sugar, that can interfere with sleep patterns. And would you say that's an absolute no-no for the entire day? Or would you say, you know what, don't have any snacky bad things from 4 p.m. or 2 p.m. or... I think it's really the, the whole circadian rhythm thing is affected by everything you yeah, eat. Right. So just thinking, well, I've been good now, so then I can just gorge on something is probably still going to impact the blood glucose. Um, but it's also a question of can you combine carbohydrates with something else? So if you do want, I don't know, your jacket potatoes or your white refined rice or your white baguette, are you able to include a little bit of protein in that? to help stabilize the blood glucose. So rather than just gorging on a handful of Haribo's or something similar, um, you know, can we get you some carbohydrate that won't necessarily cause such a big spike? So it's not all carbs are bad at all. And I think a lot of people get very confused about sugar and carbs. Um, but what we don't want is very erratic blood sugars throughout the day. And equally, I suppose we don't want people to go to bed starving. 
they well, are going to sleep. Other, well, you yeah. see, this is the thing. We talked about not eating too much in the evening, but actually, if you're starving and your blood glucose has really dipped, then you're going to start producing a lot of cortisol. And cortisol, which is the stress hormone, will block melatonin. So you, you, you need to have something to eat. You don't want to be starving, but equally, mm. you don't want to be overfull. And you'll get up in the middle of the night and stuff your face and well, you'll yeah. get to sleep. Well, a, a big part of that is that the, the primary hunger hormone that we have in the gut um, that signals hunger to the brain, it, the peak of that in a circadian rhythm sense, interestingly, is in the biological evening. It's about 7 p.m. clock time. Um, and so what you tend to see with patterns of somewhat more disordered mm-hmm. eating is when people try and restrict energy intake earlier in the day, and they end up in the evening then home after a long day, stressful day maybe, and they haven't had enough energy intake earlier in the day. They're quite predisposed then to overeating mm-hmm. in the evening simply because they're coinciding coming home, having undereaten during the day with that peak in their, in their circadian hunger. So eating more earlier in the day dampens that, that peak in, in hunger signaling the evening, which is why I think for people that are struggling perhaps with that pattern of energy intake and are coming home in the evening and finding themselves overeating, actually taking the time to have a breakfast or mm-hmm. consume more energy earlier in the day or have a more substantial lunch can, can really help with that, that overall picture. Mm. And what about hydration? say being hydrated during the day is that is that important in terms of facilitating a better night's sleep well it's interesting because actually i encourage people i have quite a few clients that often have to get up in the night to to wee to go to the toilet so i actually encourage them to um, drink plenty through the day but then stop about two hours before they go to bed Um, otherwise or they they may sleep well and in the sense that they get to sleep but they're just constantly waking up to go to the toilet. Mm-hmm. So I think, yes, hydration, of course, and there's lots of other reasons to keep yourself hydrated, but don't be drinking a lot of liquid late at night. And where's your cutoff for caffeine? Well, that really depends on the individual because you can have what's called fast metabolizers, slow metabolizers of caffeine. Um, the half-life is anything from three to seven hours. They normally say around about five hours. Um, some people of course will say I can drink caffeine until 10 o'clock at night and I'm fine Um, but it's also to do with quality of sleep and not just do I actually sleep Um, so I normally encourage my clients to stop around about three o'clock in the afternoon in terms of caffeine what they forget is that caffeine is found in a lot of things not just coffee and tea and so then if they're gorging on lots of hot chocolate or chocolate um, late at night that could equally cause them a few problems as well what about you? How do you feel about caffeine? I think it's a balancing act between someone's individual tolerance. Mm. Um, and I think that generally the three o'clock uh, cutoff point is, is sensible for most people. Um, if someone is a slow metabolizer, you know, when we say half-life, we mean that that means that the dose only reduces by 50%. So mm. someone could still have a lot of circulating mm. caffeine that would impair sleep quality. So for some people, it could just be timing their coffee intake for for the morning period before midday. Mm. So I think it really does depend. And I think people do have to be relatively honest with themselves and their caffeine intake to see, are they having the kind of restorative sleep that they should? And if they feel that they're sleeping an eight hour block, but still fatigued the next day, or perhaps having a couple of wakings in the middle of the night that's not bathroom related, then probably looking at their caffeine intake and seeing well how late am i consuming caffeine and and could i could i bring it forward so um i think with with things like coffee and tea we have to stack up the quite well established health benefits of Mm. of coffee and tea when i say coffee i mean black coffee not a starbucks venti frappa something (laughs) but we have quite established health benefits to them so yes they contain caffeine they also have good good health effects so i think it's just for the individual, find out where your where your cutoff point is for yourself. But generally, a kind of two to three p.m. is absolutely mm. sensible. I have probably about. This is embarrassing to say. I probably have twenty five cups of tea a day. I drink a serious amount of tea, and I always have done since I was very very young. Um, and I sleep like a log. Mm. But what you're saying is, I mightn't really be sleeping like a log. I might. I could probably even sleep 
better if I ditched the well, you, you could. It's, it's, unless we lock you in a lab <laughs> no and thanks. hook up electrodes to your head. <laughs> it's really difficult to, to know, you know what the quality of your sleep is like. I mean, I think uh, an easy enough question to ask people is, do they, do they have dreams and do they remember dreams? Mm, yeah. Because typically dream state will occur when we're in REM sleep. So, But if people are, you know, you'll often ask that question, they're like, I can't remember the last time I had a yeah. dream. So I think it depends. Tea also doesn't have as, as high much. a caffeine yeah. content as, right. as, as coffee. 25 cups might add up. Um, <laughs> but I think generally it, it really, that this particular issue is very individual mm, yeah. and it's, it's difficult to give any kind of broad mm, black mm. and white recommendations. I often also, when my clients love their tea, what I will do is just gradually switch them on to, um, particularly in the evening, if they're having problems sleeping, things like chamomile, yeah. which we know Ooh. from the studies has actually <laughs> been shown to help no improve sleep. So yeah. but it's not the only one, obviously. Yeah. There's lemon balm, there's passion for that. You know, there's lots of these um, herbal teas, but it's, it's a start. But the other yeah. one is, is um, ruibosch, of course, which is South African, mm. um, very high in antioxidants, but won't contain the caffeine. caffeine. Mm. And a mm. lot of people find that very tolerable um, because some people will add milk to that, so it almost looks a little yeah, bit like Yeah, it seems to tea. be the one that's closest to black tea yes. in terms of a substitute yes. that's caffeine-free. Yeah. Mm. Not convinced. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about supplements, supplementing your diet? What, what, where's that going to help me in terms of sleeping? Well, I, I think the first thing is to get your diet right. Um, for me, food always comes first. There's no point if someone's just having a very erratic, fast food refined diet than to just down a load of supplements and but expect them to sleep. That is the sort of modern I'm way of thinking, it is. isn't it? I'm you know, afraid it is, but... Yeah, I'll, it, I'll go to the gym, I'll eat really badly and yeah, I'll stuff yeah, my face with supplements yeah. and I should be fine. If someone who's eating a very healthy diet or what appears to be a healthy diet, is there any... I mean, what, are there any particular well, individual certain foods that I would mm -hmm. probably get them to start with first. Yeah. So if we know that things like magnesium can be very useful, then I would encourage them to, particularly in the evening, to eat more magnesium-rich foods. So things like, you know, just a handful of almonds or a whole load of leafy greens, for example. Equally, um, there have been some studies on cherry active or, or, or similar sort of tart cherry juice, uh, which is a natural source of melatonin. And there have been various studies where just drinking a glass of that about an hour before you go to bed can improve sleep. So there are foods that I would rather they tried first. Um, but yes, there are supplements. But equally with magnesium, and if you exercise a lot, because magnesium's an electrolyte, we can sweat it out. And a lot of my athletes are often low in magnesium. What they will do is they will have a bath of Epsom salts, which is just magnesium sulfate. And you can get that from any chemist. Um, and simply just soaking in a bath. One, it's relaxing anyway, so there's lots of therapeutic benefits of just calming the body down. Um, but equally soaking in and getting a little bit of extra magnesium. They're, they're more natural ways. Mm -hmm. What are, do you think the biggest myths around sleep and nutrition, the, the, the links with you know, people that come and or ask you questions, um, sort of crazy stuff that people think? Uh, well, there, there was one study of a milk formula in the 1970s that took a while to be dispelled out of people's minds, which was this idea that, you know, milk has some kind of particular properties that enhance sleep. Um, and actually, there was uh, an article recently in the paper about um, uh, farmers that were feeding their cows um, kind of melatonin on top and saying that they were producing this melatonin enriched milk and uh, that that would enhance that sleep. sleep. So, <laughs> no, I mean, typically, you know, there's been some um, kind of myths about not necessarily isolated nutrients, but more things like, oh, we don't need to worry about the timing of food intake, you know, late night eating doesn't, you know, and, and, and typically what's looked at in that sense is weight loss studies where people are eating, you know, five, 700 calories less than they ordinarily would. So in that context of an energy deficit, maybe the timing's less relevant, but that's not representative of people at the population. So I think that for me, the biggest myth has been that that timing is irrelevant mm. for mm. sleep quality, and and that's categorically not supported by, by really any literature outside of the odd weight loss study. For me, it's alcohol, because I always get clients to say, 
I have to have a drink, that will help me get to sleep. And actually, it's unlikely to help. In fact, it's more likely to cause real problems. We know it can affect things like dopamine, which can then be more stimulating, so it actually can you know, um, make you feel slightly more awake. Um, it can also interfere with blood sugar. Uh, it can also interfere with the circadian rhythm of melatonin production. So although some people will feel that it helps to get them to sleep quicker, mm. their quality of sleep is absolutely disrupted. Um, and that I think that comes up all the time about, oh, no, I'll have a little nightcap. Mm. Mm, probably not a good idea. And I guess the quality of sleep after, if people have had a really sociable weekend and they're heading into Monday, the quality of their sleep on a Sunday night isn't going to be great, is it? Well, and the other interesting thing is that can then set up a really bad pattern for the whole week because lack of sleep can also interfere with the um, hunger hormones as well. So it can actually mm. depress um, hormones that are like leptin, which are related to appetite. Mm -hmm but actually increase your hunger. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. what you're more likely to then do is start craving on things to keep your energy up, so the sugar, the caffeine. And then, of course, that will have a knock-on effect the next day. So it can be a little bit of a vicious cycle, yeah. um, particularly if you've had a great party weekend. Yeah, and you're... Yeah, and w when you look at that research, people assume <clears throat> that it's dramatic sleep deprivation. It's yeah, really it's not. not. A lot of that research that looks at the effects of of lack of sleep on subsequent energy intake, for example, and appetite and hunger, you're talking five and a half hours sleep. Mm, yeah. Some people would consider that a good night's good sleep. Night sleep. Mm, yeah. And what we see predictably the next day is a preference for very energy dense foods that are high in sugar, fat and salt. And that's often because there is a desire to have increased energy for the extended wakefulness of, of having a lack of sleep. Mm. Um, and there's up to a 22% increase in people's caloric intake the following day after five and a half hours sleep that ties to the dysregulation in appetite and hunger hormones. So there is a knock on effect. And the other thing that's come out of that research is we've typically associated jet lag as quite extreme. You know, you fly to LA and you're out of kilter, but there's a term now coming out of the circadian research called social jet lag. And that's basically what it sounds like it's people mm -hmm. spend their monday to friday trying to catch up on the sleep they lost from the weekend but then they get to friday i have and that the opposite way around <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're, you're trying to make up for the, the weeks the week's work on the weekend but yeah so social jet lag is the difference between how much sleep you you would need and how much you actually get mm -hmm. relative to not just socializing but also work and stuff so it, it is something to, to to i think for us to generally start paying attention to is mm -hmm. you know how much do we knock ourselves out of kill a little bit not necessarily in the extreme sense like flying to Australia but actually kind of habitually in our and daily and weekly lives changes. so what would they be what would your simple changes be to someone who's thinking right what do I need to do mm. nutritionally I've looked at everything else I can't sleep I've got mm. the blackout blouse the earplugs the good bed etc etc I still can't sleep yeah so uh, going f firstly back to the sort of timing so three regular meals uh, evening meal, try and bring it slightly earlier um, if they were someone that was eating it late. Make sure you've got some easy to digest protein and carbohydrates. So, you know, nothing complicated. It could just be rice with some fish and vegetables. I mean, it's n nothing complicated. Not lots of spice if you get lots of heartburn. Not lots of fat if also you get heartburn or digestive problems. Um, and, you know, if you are struggling, then maybe a glass of cherry juice an hour before you go to bed, a handful of nuts, an Epsom salt bath. Those sort of simple changes can have actually quite a profound effect on quality of sleep. Mm -hmm. Any other tips from you? Huh? I would say, uh, and we briefly touched on this earlier, but in the overall circadian kind of rhythm over the, the whole day, giving yourself distinct cycles of feeding and fasting that correspond mm -hmm. with being awake or being asleep. So a simple thing for people is just having an eating window of around 10, maybe 11 hours. What you see at, at the population level in the UK is most people are spending up to 15 or 16 hours a day, you know, in, in a post fed state. So, you know, if you're having breakfast at eight, having dinner at seven, but if, again, if you're not going to be able to have dinner that early, you could delay breakfast an extra hour, for example, and eat at eight. And generally in that sense, what I'd say is have more of your energy intake early in the day. Mm -hmm. In between your breakfast and your lunch, have, the, have mo most of your daily energy and dinner then relatively lighter compared to 
um, breakfast and, and lunch and in terms of composition of the meal I would agree mm-hmm. that generally a good uh, quality carbohydrate and protein based meal with a slightly lower fat mm-hmm. content. For some of my clients as well interestingly there's now quite a lot of research on the gut and how that can affect um, neurotransmitter production and your sleep patterns. And so for some of them, I will encourage them to have what we call fermented foods during the day as well. So things like yogurt, kefir, sauerkraut, um, because there's now a lot of good research on making sure you've got a good microbiome um, diversity, uh, which then also affect the brain, but also produce things like serotonin and so on. So if someone comes to me with um, some digestive problems, then I would absolutely be looking at that to help them sleep. So we've definitely got to look beyond the the blinds and the bed. And it's just basics, as you said, people mm-hmm. are sitting there, their big plasma stuffing their faces with their supplements mm-hmm. and actually they're eating terribly badly, which is why they don't sleep. Um, so, so your take home message, the one thing you would do if you were someone who's listening to this mm. and they haven't thought about diet, what, what's the one key thing? Uh, bring the evening meal slightly earlier. Yeah. Don't eat very late at night. Okay. Alan? Yeah, and give yourself distinct cycles of, of feeding and fasting. Um, so Sounds like a cat. <laughs> it really does, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, when, when we're asleep, uh, that night period is supposed to be a fasting phase. Um, and the wakeful period is, is when we consume food. People are often not eating till one and then having dinner as late as 10. And I would say be mindful of that window. Bring it slightly earlier um, and try maybe to keep things to a 10 and 11 hour daily window. So do you reckon you're going to sleep well tonight? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. A little bit of cherry juice just before I go to bed, I'll be fine. <laughs> cherry juice? Yeah. What's your secret weapon? Uh, well, my secret weapon has typically been the light exposure thing, to be perfectly honest. Um, but it's Thursday and I plan on having a glass of wine, so I'll, I'll take <laughs> <Okay>. the consequence. <laughs> you're not heeding your own advice, <laughs> I'll Alan. take the consequences. <laughs> have a cherry juice tomorrow, you'll be fine. <laughs> have a cherry juice tomorrow. Thank you so much, Alan and Christine. Lots of tips, I think, for, for people who maybe haven't thought about diet. So really, really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Sleep Matters podcast from Dreams. If you enjoyed it, then please press the like button below. And if you want to see more, then you can subscribe to the series.